If you're on social media, chances are by now you'll know about Ridimus tweets and how a respected, those are his air quotes, Indian journalist tried to bully him into being interviewed. Zaha has decided not to name the journalist, which of course is getting funnier and funnier, as pretty much everyone seems to be guessing who it is based on well, the kind of typos it is. With some excellent investigations out there by some amateur private investigators on Twitter. This is the last knock. My dad told me to say this. I don't have any information on whether it is that journalist. But I would add that the person that everyone's saying it is, is the same person that I kind of thought it was just from reading them. That was without any typos. But I don't have any evidence, so I'm not going to say it's him. So unless Rudiman Saha or someone else can clear that up, I think we're all going to guess it's the same person, but no one's going to know 100%. But the whole thing was interesting to me for a few different reasons, really. One is that the message that was sent to Rudiman Saha is very similar to what happened to ESPN's major basketball writer, who had a prospectus leaked about him, where he basically sold himself as someone who could leak stories for you, so you got extra traction from them. This is from Ethan Strauss's piece. These packets have been sent out to potential sources, presumably to argue why one should leak news to Wojnarowski versus sending it to his rivals. My sources tell me that ESPN did not create Wojnarowski's self-aggrandizing dossier. If you go over to Ethan Strauss's emailer, you'll be able to see his piece on Adrian Wojnarowski, ESPN's major basketball guy. Essentially Woj, which is what he's more commonly known as, was saying to people that he can leak your story to a wider audience than anyone else. And also, if you want, he can tag you in it, which will give you more publicity, which will boast up your own social media credential. So it's a double whammy that he's offering. Your story will get more air, but also improve your personal fame through it. And if you're an agent or a general manager, I suppose that kind of makes sense for you. And when you look at the Saha tweet, there is a really interesting message in here. You try to choose 11 journalists, which is not the best according to me. Choose whoever can help you the most. Essentially in the Saha case, this journalist is saying that he can improve things far more than a bunch of different leaks or a bunch of different interviews. That he has that level of power within the game, but also within the press. The difference here, of course, is the threats at the end. And probably, and I'm just guessing here, the lack of a real strong relationship at the start. And I'm partially just basing that on the fact that Saha never got back to any of his messages. The interesting thing for me is that this sort of journalism is quite new to cricket. We never really had cricket newsbreakers before. Cricket writers have tended to be sort of this literary colour type writing, or very earnest match reporters, or perhaps at their best, a combination of both. Actual newsbreaking by cricket writers is really not that common. It's become more so over the last few years. But even then, we don't have any celebrity newsbreakers in cricket like many other sports do. For instance, Woj has over 5 million Twitter followers, and many of them follow him like he's almost a sports team on his own, proudly calling each new item about how a player has been swapped for a second round draft pick with a Woj bomb reference. And we don't have that culture in cricket, partly because unlike the US sports, cricket is not in a league. And as far as I'm aware, I was the first global cricket writer who sort of covered all the teams. It wasn't really a beat that anyone covered before I came along. When I started, nearly everyone in cricket reported on just their home nation, and then probably the team they were playing against. You occasionally had some Crick Info staff who covered two or three teams, or at a World Cup would cover almost all the teams, but it really wasn't how cricket was covered. Almost 100% of the time, if you're a cricket writer, you would only travel if you were following your team. And in those days, the players and the writers had very close relationships. They often stayed in the same hotels, traveled on the same planes together, drank in the same bars. There wasn't a big discrepancy between their, what they were paid. In fact, in those days, the writers probably got paid more. But by the time my career started, cricket writers were now openly complaining about not getting business class or staying in five-star hotels. It was quite clear that the industry was completely reinventing itself. That is why someone like me could slip in and, and get a job. Previously, I would have had no hope. And while those journalists were moaning because they preferred to have legroom and, you know, a pillow menu, <laughs> it was also important from the perspective that you could form bonds with the players by staying in those good hotels and having access to them on the players. Because it was quite clear that the cricketers and the press were getting further apart. And every year I see that more and more. Cricket currently has probably the best crop of media managers that I've seen while I've been working in the game. But even then, there's certainly a barrier between the press and the players. And as far as I can tell, no one has really tried to fix that. The players are happy with that barrier. The press are upset with that barrier. And the boards are kind of stuck in the middle. And remember, this is an era where some boards are actually starting their own websites. And that makes it even trickier because they don't want outside media to have more access than they do. Perhaps one of the few places where this hasn't been as big of a problem has been in US sports. The actual gap between what a sports journalist earns in America and what an athlete earns is probably higher than anywhere in cricket. So the gap should be wider between the press and the players. 
That means that the person and the players have a proper relationship there. It's public, open, and it works far more than any relationship that involves a press conference. Once you get a player behind a desk with a bunch of lights in their face, they're naturally a lot more defensive than when you're just chatting to them in the locker room as they're relaxing. And it also really helps the players. Players in this situation have the ability to talk to writers about their pieces. And the press have the ability in an hour to clear up an entire story that would take months otherwise just because of trying to get contact with all these different people. And it's certainly not a perfect situation. Not all players are happy to be changing while they have journalists around. Obviously, allowing women in the locker room was a huge sticky point for a lot of people in sport. And with COVID, the press are currently out of the locker rooms, of course. And the NBA have already talked about keeping that as a permanent solution. And I think that would be a mistake, even if I understand that sometimes the players have reservations about it and that it's not a perfect situation. But cricket simply does not have a good enough connection between players and the press. And while I appreciate that in the modern world, players can and should tell their own stories, there is always going to be a media and they play a huge role in professional sports, from the broadcasters down to the humble beat writers and social media consultants. From telling truth to power, uncovering uncomfortable secrets, all the way through to actually building the players up and making heroes out of them, or villains in some cases. Extra publicity for the sport, and writing historical documents about what these people have actually done. It would be silly to think that the media hasn't and won't continue to play a huge role in the way that sports continues to develop in our society. That's not to say that sports journalism is perfect, it's not. In fact, if sports journalism was perfect, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been able to get into this industry so easy. And I also know about the other side, the darker side. I once had a sports writer try and write a very obviously fake story about me by in a major newspaper. So I know this isn't always a rosy profession. In the same way, I know that not everything a player or official says is always true just because they've said it. And also writing about athletes is tough. As many political journalists often find out, the people that you file on go from a source to a story very quickly. That's a tricky thing to handle. And there is an element of access needed for the job. You need to be in the ground and allowed at press conferences. And as someone who has lost that right by covering stories, I can tell you it can really affect how you pay the bills. And it's why a lot of sports journalists don't break a lot of stories. They prefer to keep that access and just keep it ticking over. But as cricket and sports worldwide become bigger and bigger, we have these new kinds of journalists coming in. The news specialists like Woj and the content aggregator. The content aggregators are usually ones who take three tweets and turn it into netizens, call Rohit Sharma, dumber than dog shit. And I don't think many people take these articles that seriously, but they get a lot of hits and they keep something ticking over. But the hard news part of it is probably more interesting and that's what this is really about because that can be a very big deal. When my career started, sports journalists were kind of uninspired and happy to worry about pros and their contacts and the occasional good headline. And it's not like that now. It's much more dynamic and also more opportunistic. And as cricket becomes more professional and a major part of the 24 hour news cycle, there is more work for that kind of cricket news reporter. But it's tricky to become one of them, right? Because you need to get a lot of incredible contacts. Because getting good relationships with cricketers is tough because of that lack of the ability to really bond with them normally. They're always at a distance to you. So either a friendship strikes up just normally, or it's slightly forced, but both sides kind of understand what the relationship is. But there is the third kind of way, which Joy Bhattacharya illustrated on Twitter the other day. And there is no doubt that there is plenty of interesting stuff on what he referred to as Yupu Gate, which is the U, but with a P in it for the typo. Yupu? Y y why poo? I don't know. Why poo gate? Why poo gate? Anyway, this is one of his tweets. The other was when a fair number of journalists figured out that the best way to get access was to become more than journalists. Pick up a cricketer's wife and take them shopping. Get hold of concert tickets to a show in London. What Joy is describing there is the fixer journalist. And not match fixing, obviously. But fixing the life of the player and making things easier for them. Sometimes a player will contact me in a city where they think I know something to ask, you know, where's the good food trucks and things like that. And I think that's a fairly normal thing. But there are others who become kind of these player fixers, almost like a backup agent, making the player's life easier, making themselves an integral part of the player's existence. And it would be a complete lie to say that the players don't use these journalists as well, because these things often go bo both ways. Players might get preyed upon early, but they also realize they can spin things publicly through their, you know, friend, fixer. I don't know why I'm doing that. But for me, the entire relationship is compromised and just often a bit icky. And boards know about this, but they also don't help with this. By keeping the distance between the press and the writers, and honestly, in some cases, actively enforcing it, that means that nothing is more important than gaining access. And the kinds of people who are willing to do that will go to any lengths. Because at this point, breaking cricket news is a fairly decent business. So if you're a cricket board, do you really want to make access to your players a business on its own? 
When we were talking about Woj early on, he's really talking to agents and officials. Because while he will have good relationships with certain players, which he certainly does, a lot of that he will have got through being in the locker room, which means there would be 5, 10, 15, 20 other people also there who can also get those relationships. If the only way to get those relationships is through the icky stuff, it's awkward. And if cricket boards found a way to make their players more accessible, then these kinds of relationships would be rarer. Weirdly, cricket boards often think they are protecting their players by creating so much space. But I really think often it's complete opposite. Leaving it unregulated can't ever be a good idea. But as Woj's argument makes clear, even in the NBA, when access is money, people will do whatever they can to profit from that. And Woj is incredibly powerful, partly because he's worked hand in hand with so many important people along the way, and now because he's built this huge brand where he can make or break people. And in our particular situation with Rinnam and Saha, remember he asked for none of this. He was a player who had been dropped and was rightfully frustrated. This is his career, this is his life, his legacy. And then he received these messages and he put them up online. And for some people, hopefully not that many, he went from hero to villain in the story by not outing that journalist. I mean, let's just think about this story. Saha was dropped and then had a respected journalist try and force him into an interview with vague sorts of threats as well. I can certainly see why people would want him to name that person, but I can also understand the politics involved and he's thinking about his future career and he's pulling back a little bit. The thing is, I really just don't think it's about that one journalist. That person is preying on a bit of a broken system, which has been around for quite a while now. And unfortunately, the industry has changed around that broken system and making it even worse. But of course, if I was to talk to that journalist, whoever they actually are, I would say you or Waipu should know better.